Greater than ever. <laughs> Less than that. And give it one more minute. Awesome. Wait, you get to go, Jesse? Yeah, All right. Oh, oh. What? <laughs> no, I switched them. I thought they were switched. Oh, to I was oh, okay. confused. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the town board of the town of Austin's special meeting and work session for Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. Please rise and join me for the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council Member Feldman, present. Council Member Minichio, here. Council Member Meyer, present. Council Member Field, present. Supervisor Lemonberg. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start off with the announcements. I'm so excited to share that the town and village of Austin have once again been recognized as Park Three Day Stars in the Hudson Valley by 511 New York Rideshare HP. We had 41 pledges of people that were going to go car free or car light during car free week, and that was the highest for any municipality in the Hudson Valley. We continue to work together with our partners to find alternative means of transportation in lieu of single passenger fossil fuel vehicles for commuting. As we have mentioned, and we will continue to do, notices are in the mail now or already received um, regarding the new Westchester Power Electricity Supply contract. This new contract will help us lower our carbon footprint with 100% green electricity supply and guaranteed steady rates, which we know is so critical during this current volatile energy market. Learn more about the new contract by visiting www.sustainablewestchester.org slash WP. Please get the facts so you can make an educated decision about whether to stay in the program or opt out when the new contract goes into effect on November 1st. Cold and flu season is upon us. Make sure to get your flu shot to be protected against the flu this season, in addition to the new COVID-19 booster, which protects against the original strain and Omicron strain of the virus. COVID vaccines are offered at OVAC on Fridays. Walk-ins are welcome, but appointments are encouraged and preferred. Make your appointments at osmevac, that's V-A-C dot org. OVAC is not yet offering flu vaccines, but flu vaccines are readily available at most pharmacies and healthcare providers. I'm happy to report I received mine through Radish Health, our concierge health provider, last week when we aimed to get our entire health staff vaccinated. Mark your calendars now for Thursday, November 3rd at 6 p.m. at the Austin Community Center, 95 Broadway, for the Austin Shoreline Revitalization Community Meeting to share feedback on the draft shoreline improvements that have come out of the, the Climate Adaptive Design Studio number two. We look forward to hearing your input on how we can improve the waterfront to reflect your values and priorities and interpreter and translated materials <laughs> will be available for Spanish speakers. Learn more about this project and its importance at greenosting.org. Thank you, Austin, for hosting. GreenAustin.org slash shoreline dash resilience. Speaking of environment protection, Westchester County government recently released an excellent video reminding everyone to flip over their ballots when they go to vote next month. 
The flip side of the ballot contains a question about whether or not to pass New York's Clean Water, Clean Air, and Clean Jobs Environmental Bond Act. If yes wins, the $4.2 billion bond act will fund restoration and flood risk reduction, climate change mitigation, open space land conservation, recreation, and water quality improvement and resilient infrastructure. We have linked to this informational video on our town website. Be sure to check it out as you consider your options for November and actually early voting starts October 29th. You can vote early any place in Westchester County if you're a Westchester County resident um, during early voting from October 29th through November 6th, no voting on November 7th, and then election day is November 8th. At this point, you can just vote at your regular home. A couple of dates to remember for access to county services. This Saturday, October 22nd, the Westchester County Mobile Shredder will be back in town at the Briarcliff Department of Public Works at 10 Buckout Road in Briarcliff from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Residents can bring up to four file size boxes of confidential papers and capsules. Remember to remove all or your clips and covers. Papers from businesses are not allowed, and remember to just include truly personal documents. No junk mail does not count. The Westchester County Clerk's Office will be bringing its community outreach mobile, oh, sorry, its community outreach mobile office to the Joseph B. Pluto Community Center on Wednesday, October 26th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that's 95 Broadway, the very same place we just discussed early voting would be. Apply for a passport, access, notary services, and more. Make your plans now to access the service so that you are ready for the necessary payer for work on the 27th. We'll send a separate e-blast with more details this weekend so you can prepare. Now around the Halloween fun around Ossie and this week. This Friday, October 21st from 6 to 9 p.m. Head over to Nelson Park for a pumpkin patch co-hosted by the Ossie Rec Department and Ossie Police Department. Get the pumpkins, enjoy a donut and cider, and of course, join the hayride. Costumes are optional, but I mean, come on, this is the season. Reservations are required. Visit visitvillageofoxygen.org to register. Saturday Exploring Run is back at AMD Middle School. This Saturday, October 22nd from 9.30 to 11 a.m. with a fall festival theme. Connect and learn with various community partners and enjoy a free breakfast. If you missed Friday's pumpkin patch, make sure to head to AMD during Saturday Exploring Run to catch the hayrides for another pumpkin. And don't forget, Old Time is holding the Halloween costume collection now through October 21st. They're collecting donations of new or gently used Halloween costumes for distribution by Old Prime at Saturday's Exploring Run. Drop your donations off at the Austin Police Department, Austin District Offices at 400 Executive Boulevard, or Austin Public Library. Help if you can to make sure every child in Austin gets an opportunity to have fun with Halloween. And these events are just the start of Halloween fun happening this year in Austin, check out my supervisor's update. Yes, that's true, but there's even more if you want to start planning your Halloween weekend activities a bit early. This weekend, Saturday, October 22nd and 23rd is the Westchester, Saturday, October 22nd and Sunday, October 23rd is the Westchester Craft Crawl from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. featuring 50 plus regional professional craft artists at locations in Austin and Clinton. Learn more at westchestercraftcrawl.com and make your shopping plan for the weekend, I can guarantee that you should you'll spend a lot of money. Look, because they are fantastic crafts. This Sunday, October 23rd, join our common beliefs for a virtual book conversation on We Refuse to Be Enemies, How Muslims and Jews Can Make Peace, One Friendship at a Time, with the authors Sabina Raymond and Walter Ruby. The discussion starts at 3 p.m. Register at ourcommonbeliefs.com. Shout out to our friend Bola Nasir for planning this event. Also on Sunday, October 23rd at 7 p.m., the local favorite Norm God will be performing in the chapel at Scarborough Church fundraising for Open Arms for Refugees and the Emergency Shelter Partnership here in Austin, which travels around all of the entire of Austin um, houses of worship uh, throughout the winter. Join to support some very worthy causes in our community and enjoy a wonderful performance. That's it for my announcements. Again, thank you, Shelton Nelson. Oh, okay, so with that, we are going to uh, go to our first poll for the resolution. 
Construction Helping Agreement to resolve with the Town Board of the Town of Austin authorized the supervisor to sign a consulting agreement with Fernando Gonzalez IAS. So uh, we have this one resolution on our special meeting for tonight to approve a consulting agreement with our recently retired Fernando Gonzalez. Fernando retired at the uh, end of September, but has agreed to do some consulting work for the town as we transition to a new assessor. We're happy to be keeping Fernando and such a wealth of knowledge on board for the town for a little while longer. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. There's no motion. Oh, sorry. Motion. Second. All right, that's Diane. Aye. Motion and second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn to the work session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, okay, so work session agenda. We have uh, first our very own Honorable Holly Berlitz with her departmental report from the tax receipt. Holly just finished tax collection from the season. We're at Uber's tax school taxes and collecting on the tax mark on behalf of the Austin Public School District. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I've asked. Uh, Doctor needs to be put up. Okay, here we go. There it is. And, then, okay. and, and there it is. So, uh, the first thing I'm going to address is we did have a uh, collection through the month of September, which was the first half of 2022 2023 school taxes. And great news, uh, we were at 95.9% uh, of the first half of the letter been collected. And remember that we've also, uh, we have payments coming in that are, believe it or not, still uh, not so many anymore, but still postmarked as of September 30th. Uh, so we're still, collections are still coming in. Delinquency notices are going to go out by the end of the week. Uh, I also wanted to note that 4.2% of the second half has been uh, collected. And again, people tend to come in sometime between you know, October through the end of the year before they actually, before the actual due date issues January 31st, 2022. Um, again, I'd like to report that it was very smooth. Um, I think that uh, taxpayers felt taken care of down here on the first floor. Uh, thanks again to the post office for their hospitality. We have a little, we call the satellite office where we're collecting. And, um, you know, I think well, people miss coming up to the third floor and people ask about coming up again. Um, they're, they're delighted that we're there and our faces are there. Um, they miss the chocolate. <laughs> COVID can do that. Anyway, um, 2022 town and county taxes, which were due in April, I just wanted to have you note on the uh, document that we're 99% of the warrant has been collected. So again, pretty, you know, very, very good, good stats on that. So overall, uh, takeaways are our collections on both of the active warrants are in really good shape and, and very pleased with them. Uh, our next collection will be in January. Uh, we have to sort of share the satellite office with our village colleagues because as you know, the first half of village village those people who live in the village of Austin, the first half of village taxes are due by January 31st, second half of school will be January 31st as well. But I think we have a really good rhythm uh, between the two areas collecting. Uh, someone comes to school first, I ask them if they also live in the village or I can tell our story and we sort of transfer the taxpayers back and forth to make sure people forget, you know, people just forget. Uh, my my email alert system just gets bigger and bigger. I think I'm over 3,000 people at this point. So it's very helpful. I mean, it's the best antidote to uh, people coming in and being angry that they have a, a penalty to pay. I immediately sign them up uh, for the uh, alert. And I, I think they work really, really, really well. Um, I also wanted to note that I have a personal goal, which is every month that we get collections uh, on our delinquent tax lien. 
and we have never missed a month of not having some collection come in. We, for lack of a better term, work the account to see the that um, some of our bigger, bigger uh, commercial um, taxpayers like uh, Redline Apartments and Paradise Oil appear to be calling. I'm going to tell by the kinds of calls that I'm getting that they're working towards solution. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I also want to report that the eight payment plans that we have that have been approved by the town board are all current. And um, I know I know you as well as myself feel very good about um, about this working. So that's about it, unless you have any questions. And um, did that answer anything that you might have to ask for some clarification? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Holly, I just was wondering on the 2022 delinquent tax fees, mm -hmm. and, then, and then I'm looking at the top 2022 town and county that's outstanding. That the discrepancy that I just is that 2022 is that what's owed? So a million dollars. The, the 2022 those are tax liens. This would be 2021 taxes. So what happens is that anything that's owed at the end of the um, in July, in other words, in July of 2023, any of the 2022 ta taxes that are owed become a 2023 tax fee. Thank you. And those, I, I mean, we started out with about, I think about 100 percent, well, but I think they're all about 130. So, coming down. Anything else? Any questions? Thank you. It's Thank you so much. to see you all in person. We're always so appreciative of um, your very um, wonderful way of doing something that makes people very unhappy. Um, well, some people like to get their tax rights told, um, but you know, you you make people feel good about it. We appreciate it, and we appreciate all the great customer service that we get, and um, that's what it's all about. Thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, all right, up next, uh, we we're talking about uh, local law regarding e-bikes, and um, I believe we have a set agenda here that um, we had tabled this discussion for a few weeks while we sought some additional information from the Philly Boston Consultants regarding the distinctions between regulations under local law versus state law. I'm going to turn it over to our town council to come on to the next. Yes, so we had a lengthy work session about this, I believe, in August. Um, just to back up, and this this law came from the village, and um, I guess part of New York forward is that that that's a different. There are some. Project, I think it's project. called Project Mover. Is there, is there the project that they applied for? Okay, so there is there's a grant that the village is looking for, and so this kind of presented itself to the town after the village had adopted it, um, and so we kind of are working off of, like we did with the special event policy, um, we're working off of what the village started with. And um, so the, the town board had a lengthy discussion about this at a work session in August. And I did circulate a revised draft um, incorporating those edits. Um, part of what we were looking out for from the village's planning consultants was an understanding about what exactly needed to be in this law in order for it to be uh, conducive to the grant. Um, and we spoke with Suzilla Ben Hangle. Um, at Nelson Nygaard, who was very helpful, and um, she spoke with me and Victoria uh, a few weeks ago. And um, I, I think the big parts of this that we need to see incorporated are um, allowing e-bikes and e-scooters um, in certain locations, as well as the shared program of allowing them to be um, having shared programs within the unincorporated town limits. So that is incorporated into the law. What I tried to do is incorporate the town board's comments to the extent that they were consistent with state law. 
Um, one of the things that I learned from going through the law after the last work session and from talking to Drew is that um, the village had opted to include certain provisions of, of state law in the local law. And so the intent there was to, I guess, create more knowledge um, and accessibility of information because, you know, it's kind of hard for the lay person to go searching through the vehicle and traffic law. Um, it's pretty dense, there's a lot there. Um, so by putting some of those provisions in the code, it makes it more accessible so people know what the rules are. Um, <clears throat> but that also means that the town doesn't really have the authority to alter some of them. And I know Council Member Jake Sweel has raised this issue regarding the age limits. Um, and that's something that's governed by state law. So it's not really something that we have the authority to control. Um, so it's, um, I, I did try to incorporate everything that the board had had requested or commented on at the last time around. And um, the extent of being consistent with state law. Um, I guess the question is, does the board want to go forward with having sort of this hybrid concept of provisions of state law as well as provisions of local regulation? Or would you rather just have laws that are, are within your control? Um, because it does get to be a little bit confusing, especially from a legislative standpoint as to what you can actually legislate. I mean, I guess, is there a way to have or, um, that you might have an online proof of if there's an automatic link? So police is looking up the law online and you need reference. So if you, you can get out those references to state law right embedded in to the local law like you were referring to it you're not i've never seen seen that in e-codes um that's usually what it jumps to when you're looking at the town code um the, the the town could certainly put those provisions on your website um to make it more accessible but generally when you look up the town of Athene code you're doing it through e-codes right. and i've never seen um where where, where there's something hyperlinked to state law, you can you certainly reference it, and I did include references because in some situations, um, I thought it was just too confusing, or there had to be a cross reference so that um, someone knew what the requirements were. For instance, a requirement for helmet is a very lengthy, um, detailed description, and so we cross reference that. So there there can certainly be references, and someone can just copy and paste that and put it into Google, and you know it should pop up. But I, I don't know if there's the accessibility. I mean, it would be great if there was. And we, we've, certainly, we've, <laughs> we've certainly done it in the past where we've cited provisions of state law, um, especially with a lot of the, the tax um, exemptions, you know, like we'll be talking about where we talked about with the, with the senior tax exemption and um, what we did earlier in the year with the veterans tax exemption. That's all governed by state law. But generally what we do is we just um, extrapolate within the state law into what we're able to control. Here it's kind of a hybrid where in some instances it's the town making policy and in other instances we're just kind of regurgitating what state law already says. Is there a problem with this having as long as it's accurate now? You know, we, we we just have to be careful to use. So if the state um, changes the law a couple of years down the road and ours still says this, it's a problem. Yes, but that happens in a lot of situations, right? So um, for instance, the example I was giving earlier about the the tax exemption. So the it we have to stay up to date on what the state is allowing, otherwise we can become outdated. Um and a, a lot of what we do, uh, what a, a lot of what's legislated does come from authority from the state. So um, it, it's something that we would have to keep an eye on, certainly. Um, but like I said, I think the intent and the goal was to have the information be more accessible. If there's other mechanisms to do that, like um, if they're, you know, now that the town has this nice fancy new website, um, if we wanted to put, like have a link that says, you know, here are the state rules regarding um, e-bikes and scooters, um, that's something we could look into as well. 
but it seems like for, for the purposes of this law, as far as it relates to um, the village and the grant, what we what the, the main goal is to authorize the shared system. And then also the, what the what's specifically dictated under state law that's under local control is time, place, and manner restrictions as to where these types of um, vehicles can be used on what roads and the board previously determined that they would be allowed on any roads that are paved roads where vehicles can be basically. I guess when I would be on fines for a term that we should go to a bond change just reference the state law um, just because of the, the, the fact that as the, as the state law changes the reference will still be good. In other words, it will be updated in state law. Whereas, you know, it wouldn't seem to be able to be. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily have to update ours to still be in full compliance. And it can say um, in the law as amended, so it would it would automatically right. incorporate. Right. right. Um, and so it would give that reference to the public for anyone that's looking at the code, but without actually specifying information that may at some point, like like you said, become I don't think it precludes us from sharing that out in public information, however, if sure. we were playing. If we can include a link on the website. Right, exactly. I mean, we can include yeah, in addition to. Yeah, to, to, to you know, here's the law, whatever. Or, you know, we could also just, um, you know, have some kind of additional information that would go along with any sure type of link you might have in the future. So that we know. Yeah, I was just thinking it would be some of the FAQ. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. I think also both the village and the town board should make sure that we communicate this to the Austin School District for them to distribute because, um, as I mentioned before, there are students that use these vehicles to get to school, whether it's the AMD or OHS. And so I think the parents need to know that this is going. Yeah, under a certain age. Right, yeah. it's not allowed under school. Yeah, I think that we both boards need to communicate to the school district. So, were there any other were there any particular comments you see from side writing with the W subscription that anybody had from the um, last draft that was shared around? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll have, based upon these comments, I'll have to go back and do another revision. Okay. Um, a public hearing was noticed for next week. So I anticipate the board would likely carry that over. Um, I'll, I'll have a revised draft for you in advance of that, but just to give the public um, an opportunity. I mean, really, I don't think substantively anything is going to change other than the fact that certain things that are in there will be removed. And just it, it replaced with cross references to state law. So substance there, there won't be. I don't anticipate any additions, but it will be different. So um, based upon our discussions, I I don't think there's any urgency to this. So my re recommendation would be um, reopen the public hearing. It has been re-noticed, yeah. and then we'll carry that over until the next legislative session, and then hope to see we'll hear what the public has to say, and then perhaps the board could be in position to take action. Yeah. All right. So um, next up, it is time for us to go out to bid once again for residential records collection. Uh, we have prepared an RFP that is fairly similar to the 2017 version, except that we moved the bid option for food scraps collection because the town currently participates in the Westchester County intermunicipal agreement for food scraps collection. The county also suggested that if the town does decide to move forward with curbside food scrap collection, it would be better to do that as a separate bid because there may be some similar haulers with composting facilities on site who would bid on that portion of the work separate from residential collection. We circulated a draft of the RFP to the board in advance. Uh, does anybody have any questions or concerns about the RFP? Yeah, we okay, we did consult again with our uh, our superintendent as well as our foreman to make sure that everything was set up and we wanted to see the parks. A couple of things that, that I was going to put in to make sure all the dates are right. And then uh, 
what is our next step with a day of one thing? They do not pick up any person at the airport. Is that the airport? Okay. That will be another question. Okay. Um, I'll find But yeah, they'd like to. So the next step would be um, at the board meeting next week on the 25th to um, authorize the going up to bid and then you know, we'll notice and publish and circulate the bid documents. Um, and we'll probably specifically that about three weeks. Um, I don't think we're anticipating a large number of responses. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that we have something in place for the beginning of the year. This is more a due diligence step than, than a necessity. So, before we get on, the, the loan complaint is in mm -hmm. the not for profit. Yeah. And it's in the village. And it was a village pickup. Correct? Okay. Does the village pickup modern not for profit? I don't know if that might be. Um, so I think we have to find out what you know, more more information about that. And right now, we don't need to pick up the lease for the yeah. phase of all enforcement. Right, and the beginning to pick up. Yes, we pick up. Right, right. But I just, I think we need to compare apples to apples to make sure that we're not doing something for a not for profit and not be for Yeah, no, it wouldn't be for the bugs as well, just for the site. Okay, either or I'm just saying I just I think but I don't think it you know it's okay because I think we just want to make sure that you know we're consistent with absolutely yeah, I just have a question for Tracy too just um during this point is that like we want to go over the program that we want everybody to buy during the garbage can so it's the uniform throughout the town so then does it go into this bid or would that be a total separate thing that the town would have to undertake you're talking about what garbage recycle the, the bins they that we wanted to offer that they're all have the same uniform bins that maybe the, the hauler or the bidder might recommend to make it's less expensive or something because they're all uniform. I've seen that program being for residential, residential, residential pickups. They're yeah. allowed to order like they did with the recycle bins in the, in the village, mm -hmm. the blue ones and all that stuff. If we were to go out and have these uh, garbage bins that are all uniform, would that be have to go in this bid or is that something the town that's trying to take on its own? I mean, Theoretically, it would probably go in this bit. It depends on how are, are we giving them to people. No, they would have to purchase them. So, like, if everybody's known, say, listen, if you want to keep the garbage at the same quantity, the same tonnage that you're picking up, and everything like that, we give them the option to purchase in bulk from the town at a certain price at a discounted rate. Mm -hmm. And this way, so it would be all uniform in the garbage. Outfit whoever picks this up will be a clean sweep right across. They'll be picking up the same way. Because as you notice, when people put their garbage out, it's all different kinds of recept uh, receptacles. Um, Councilman Maggio, we do provide, sorry, um, I, I think I hear what you're saying. I, we do already provide recycling bins to anyone in the unincorporated town that requests them. So they just have to call the highway department and they will drop them off. Um, I think what you're also referring to, I've heard more frequently with municipalities where the hauler is shifting to um, like automated pickups, no, not automated, where you don't have like a guy on the back of the truck where it's actually the, it has to be compatible with the truck that the hauler is using. Um, so I guess potentially that's something that, um, you know, our, our company may request at some point in time. They haven't as of yet. So that's what I'm most familiar with in that regard, but we could certainly ask uh, the highway superintendent to look into it further. That's what I was asking. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I do have a quick question. Uh, is it the board's ultimate decision which caller is chosen? Uh, ultimately, you have to go with the lowest responsible bidder. Right, but I mean, is it the board's ultimate decision? Well, you have to go with the lowest responsible bidder. Okay. Yeah, um, so, all right. Uh, the reason why I'm asking, I just want to make sure that I don't have any kind of conflict because yes. I'm on the Westchester County Solid Waste Commission board as a member. And so, well, you I may have, have to recuse yourself. Yeah, I may have to recuse. That's, okay. what that's what I'm saying. Okay. I may have to recuse myself. So do, do they work with any specific contractor, or is, is it more just the policy? We decide which haulers get licenses or which haulers get fines. Okay. 
So I guess we, we may have to wait and see what the bids come back yeah. and look like and which which um, contractor we're, we're looking at and then we can make that decision. But um, after, ultimately it's lowest responsible bidder um, and ultimately the board does approve that contract credit. Yeah. Um, Thank you. All right, uh, anything else on that? I'll just second. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's it for our lovely workshop tonight. And I have a motion to adjourn to the executive session for advice and counsel. Very well. Second. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Thank you all for joining us. We will see you next Tuesday, October 25th, for our legislative session right back here at 16 Frozen Avenue and via Zoom. See you then.